Stanford University. Thank you. Thank you all. It reminds me of an introduction I had once from a staff member who got up and said, and now somebody who deserved no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Senior moment, huh? <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here. I realize I stand between a Nobel Prize winner and lunch, so it's with some uh, trepidation that I'm here. But I think um, this marks an important moment, our first uh, Neuroscience Institute inaugural symposium and something I think we're tremendously excited about and I hope the past day and a half have really been productive. You know, in thinking about my brief remarks this morning, I was struck by how much I feel we're at the beginning of a really important era. And since we're here at Nerd Nation, I can admit to you that my favorite TV show in the 1960s was not I Dream of Jeannie or the Beverly Hillbillies or Bonanza, it was Star Trek. And you'll remember that incredible opening line, space, the final frontier. Well, that's the way I think about the human brain. We're really at the beginning of a tremendous period. Maybe not the final frontier, but certainly the new and one of the most exciting frontiers. And I think it's one where universities have a particularly special role to play, not only because of their ability to look at long-term discontinuous research, to look out over the horizon at distances that not even industrial research labs can begin to even think about, M much further out, to advance knowledge, to create new technologies, and to see those technologies move beyond the boundaries of the academy. But we also bring another incredible ability, the ability to bring together people, experts from all different disciplines to collaborate in new ways and to work on those discoveries. Uh, I've long held the opinion that universities have a unique advantage when we're talking about long-term problems. Their ability to focus on basic research, their ability to think about challenges in a ver very different way, and of course, one of the most vital assets we ever have, young, energetic brains eager to apply their talents and their insights and their knowledge to new problems. In some sense, Research students, graduate students, and postdocs are the secret ingredient in a university, something that I think everybody in industry would like to have but doesn't quite know how to get. So we have to put those advantages uh, to use in, in new ways. There's another key advantage universities have, and that's the symbiotic relationship between research and teaching. I think we all realize that the best way to teach the next generation of graduate students is in a research setting. They not only serve as people who will go forward and begin working on those problems, but they also serve as a kind of seed plant going out beyond the bounds of the university when they graduate, bringing that knowledge and moving the field, uh, moving the field forward. And this is a university that's deeply rooted in a pioneering spirit, in a willingness to take risks, in a willingness to do things uh, differently, in a willingness to think about the broad impact of its work. In a few years, it will be seven decades since Felix Bloch discovered magnetic resonance. Seven decades. And it's just over 50 years, 60 years, since Stanford won its first Nobel Prize for that work. I think when that work was done, it was basic physics. Today, of course, it's the technology that underlines MRIs. And all of us who've had them along the way and people who studied the brain are immensely grateful for that discovery. It didn't, what was perhaps amazing when the discovery was done, it didn't take very long for that to move quite quickly from first a basic physics discovery to a tool used primarily by people doing structural biology, to quickly a tool being used to study the human brain and other soft tissues. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing result. Uh, I, I, the one story that I've always found interesting is when I talked to Paul Berg about his work. And Paul made a wonderful quote about it in talking about when he won the Nobel Prize. I have this conviction, he said, absolutely unshakable, that what we learn is going to be useful. It may take a generation or two, but what we are finding about will fit into the great puzzles. Of course, his work on re led to recombinant DNA and under 
created the foundation on which we build the modern biotech industry. And again, it happened a lot faster than I think Paul really believed it would. That kind of investment in basic research, I think, will be key. And of course, in a university, it begins with people. It begins with faculty or visionaries who are dedicated to working on really challenging problems. It begins with people who are willing to explore a new area, who will take a new tool that's built by one of our engineering scientists here and will put it to new use to discover something new. Those explorers, those visionaries combined to do, create a really incredible environment. Of course, people are the beginning, but it's not just enough to have people. We've got to have funding for research, and I think we've got to have adequate funding for research. And in a time with increasing research uncertainty and funding uncertainty in the federal government and other sources, adequate is becoming more important than ever. We're going to have to work with the federal government. We're going to have to ensure that President Obama's commitment to the BRAIN initiative is a really serious commitment and not simply money moving around on the table, but really commitment of new money to important long-term things. We're going to have to turn CalBrain into a vision, into something that really helps California lead in brain research and understanding. We're going to have to work with foundations to try to get foundations to take an increasing role in funding long-term basic research. We're going to have to work with disease advocacy groups to articulate to them why the basic work is critical to getting the understanding that will allow us to address neurodegenerative diseases over a longer term. And of course, we're going to have to work with private philanthropy, particularly for seeding new work, for seeding interdisciplinary work, for seeding young faculty. I believe increasingly philanthropy will be the key to supporting that kind of work. It was some 15, 16, 17 years ago when a group of Stanford faculty began gathering and brainstorming about what would eventually become BioX. They were motivated by a vision that the frontiers in the biosciences and biomedicine were incredible and that bringing together talent from across the university, from the sciences and humanities and sciences and from engineering could really create the opportunity to do groundbreaking work. Figuring out how to make that work, figuring out how to bring together groups of faculty so that the sum became greater, the whole became greater than the sum of the parts was really key. I think we figured that out. And when we look back on what BioX has done and what it's led to in creating the bioengineering department, in creating bio, the neuroventures program, we see a real vibrance for that kind of model. I think great leadership, everybody working together, great faculty pulling in the same direction. I think we've managed to understand how to build these interdisciplinary things about as well or perhaps a little better than anybody else in the research environment. And it's something we can build on as a unique asset. Of course, we're blessed with many things, a nice campus to walk around, um, a hospital and medical school that are right next to us as opposed to somewhere else, no rivers in the middle of our campus, no nasty weather, uh, bicycles are the most dangerous thing you encounter when you walk across campus. But I think it's building on that ability that will really be crucial. And we, we benefit here from incredible strength, from the strength in the medical school and engineering and in the basic science departments and humanities and science but then across the university to our great psychology department, to the education school, who I think would love to have a better understanding of how learning occurs, so that rather than using purely empirical techniques to help children who are struggling with learning differences, they can begin to understand what's happening in their brain, how it's different, and how can we build a much more scientific approach to helping young people uh, develop. I think the other thing we learned from BioX and the Clark Center was the importance of having a nucleus. Not necessarily a facility that brings together everybody, because certainly in the neuroscience community, like in many of the other interdisciplinary communities, the entire community is simply too big to bring to one place, at least on this campus. We could move it all to Redwood City, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Um, so, Getting a building that will serve as the nucleus for this activity is absolutely crucial. 
Um, if that building were not in the way, you could see the old power plant, which will go away and will be replaced by um, a new building that will house both our Neuroscience Institute as well as our Human Chemistry uh, Initiative. So putting this together, great people, adequate research funding that combines multiple sources, I think, and a facility that will enable us to do the kind of work that we need to do. It's that combination, and I think with that combination, we should strive, quite simply, to have the best neuroscience research effort anywhere. And we shouldn't settle for anything less. Einstein once said, we can't solve, we can't solve problems by using the same kinds of thinking we used in creating them. And I think the same thing is critically true here. And it's for somebody who's over a certain age limit and who's worrying about finding solutions to neurodegenerative diseases with an increasingly short span before I need those <laughs> results. I wish this initiative great luck. I thank you all for your support. This is an effort which will build on the effort of so many faculty, graduate students, and postdocs. But together, I think we can do something really terrific. Thank you, and congratulations. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.